Good evening. Welcome to Wednesday nights. Uh, let's pray and get into this. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to gather. We're grateful that we can come together. We can be in a place that's warm, full of friends and family, Lord, where we can just lean and grow in what you would have for us. We pray for our time in the study as we've been looking at this series of the line and just what happened in that divide between B.C. and A.D., Lord, and those things that you put into place to happen to change the course of history, but truly the plan that you had for each and every one of us to redeem us and to, so we, we could be your children, Lord. So we thank you. Pray for our time. We pray that I pray that I would speak rightly the words that you have. And we pray all these things. And God's people said, amen, amen. amen. All right. We're, okay, this will be the last part of this series, the line BC to AD. Tonight, as we've been kind of looking at some different things, tonight's focus or look is at a moment in time that things change. Uh, for many of us, when we came to Christ, life changed. Uh, we no longer did certain things that we did before. We didn't live the way we did before. We had a new path that we were now going on, a, a drastic change. Some change took a little bit of time, right? Not everything was corrected in us perfectly right away. Some of us prayed that certain things would be corrected right away, and God said, no, you got to bear through it a little bit. But overall, things changed in our life. And this is called a watershed moment. It's a defining moment that marks a drastic change of course in someone's life. Uh, the metaphor is truly based upon a physical watershed. And this is a ridge-like land formation that divides water as it's coming down. It splits the water into two different directions. It's helpful and it causes things to work in a different way. For us as Christian or Christ followers, we should all have a watershed moment, which is truly why I like to talk to people and to hear their story of how they came to Christ because you can see the difference of the person before they came to Christ to when after they came to Christ. And it also gives you insight when you hear people say, oh yeah, I'm totally, and they can't tell you that story. Then you get to pray for them, right? And encourage them so that you can be like, hey, you need to have this moment and not just say that you're something that you're not. In this watershed moment between B.C. and A.D., God changed the course of history. In each of the lives of a believer, we should have a moment that marks B.C. and A.D. in our life, a moment that things change from the way we were to the way things are now. So we're going to be in Luke chapter uh, 4 tonight, if you want to make your way there. And the title of the message is The Father's Line. And what we're going to see here is there was a moment in history where God changed everything. That moment came in the middle there that night when that child came into the world, but there was other moments after that, the defining moments where people chose to see if they were going to follow Christ or if they were going to go a different direction. So if you made your way there, Luke chapter 4, we're going to read verses 16 through 30 in its entirety, and then we'll go back and kind of chew it up a little bit. So picking up in verse 16 of chapter 4 of Luke, it says, So he, referencing Jesus, came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read, and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, and he read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to recover the sight to the blind, to set the liberties of those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. It says in verse 20, Then he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And all the eyes who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And, then, and they said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. Then he, Jesus, said, Surely I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the day of Elijah, 
when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent, except to Zarephath in the region of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. And, it says in verse 27, many leopards were in Israel at the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them were cleansed except for Naaman of Syrian. So all those who were in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. They rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the bro of the hill on which the city was built, that they might throw him down the cliff. Then, passing through the midst of them, he went his way. And we'll conclude right there for tonight. As we break this apart, the first thing that we see here in the passage is a warm reception in the first few verses here. At this point, Luke begins to record Jesus' ministry and works that take place. Building up to this moment in the book, in the Gospel of Luke, Luke records the announcement of John the Baptist, the announcement of Jesus Christ who becoming their births, as well as records their births that we see play out. Not only does he do this, he records about Jesus and his family obeying the laws we looked to last week and doing the things that they were um, supposed to be doing. But at the same point in time, he records the fact that after doing this, they were driven from the land to Egypt, where they would later return at a time and date to the Galilee area, basically return to Nazareth, where they would call home, and Jesus would grow up. There's also the ministry of John the Baptist that's recorded, preparing the way for the Christ, leading up to John coming to G- or Jesus coming to John, and John baptizing Jesus. Jesus is 40 days in the wilderness where he's tempted by Satan and has victory. All that takes place in Luke up to where we're at in verse 16 where Jesus walks into Nazareth. On the Sabbath, he enters the synagogue as was his custom. What we see here is that Jesus had a practice of attending synagogue on the Sabbath. So, what some might say is a mundane thing, and I'm sure you've had it when people ask you, what are you going to do this weekend? You're like, I'm going to go to church on Sunday. Oh, you're doing that thing again? Good for you. You know what I'm going to be doing? Not really, don't care. You know, but they kind of hear you, and they're like, oh, you're going to church. It gets to the point where they don't ask. They come to you, so what are you doing this Sunday? Never mind, I already know what you're going to do. You're going to go to church. You know, you should really come out and watch the football game with me. But no, no, what's not the case here? It's not a waste of time. It wasn't something that is just done week after week to check the box to make sure that you're getting in what you need to do. And at the same point in time, it's not something that we rationalize. Jesus went to synagogue for a purpose and a reason, it shows us. It also reminds us that there's a purpose and a reason that we come together to fellowship and to be around other believers and to worship God, not to do because we have to. But on that same point in time, there's many that can say, I don't need to go to church on Sunday right? They can say, I can worship God on the golf course. I can worship him at the lake. You know where my favorite place to worship God is? On my couch in my pajamas. I'm not going to judge any one of those people. Do I agree with them? No. But am I going to judge them? No. What we have to realize here is Jesus didn't go to synagogue as was his habit, or as it said there, out of um, doing it. He did it be, not to do it out of routine or a religious check the box. He did it to be with the faithful people of God, to enjoy the community of believers. And truly coming to church is what that's all about, about being together with our brothers and sisters, seeing how others are doing, encouraging and strengthening. And to be honest with you, they kind of went through it. And as custom time was, um, many of the synagogues in the area didn't have clergy or um, rabbis to lead and do. So they would pick a, a leader of the town to either read the different passages that would take place in the service from the Torah. They would do the teaching and different things. If so be, if a visiting rabbi was traveling through, they would ask them to read. But this is the perfect opportunity. The elders of the town have heard word of what Jesus has been doing. He's come home. Dude, we got to have the hometown boy come in and teach. So they invite Jesus to teach. And the synagogue, he goes through the tradition and stuff. He stands up and he teaches that morning in the synagogue, which leads us to the next thing that we see there. I 
I messed up something, huh? Try it. Nope. Oh, there we go. The word read. So Jesus takes force. He gets a passage of scripture. And just know this. It wasn't like they handed him a random uh, scroll of scripture to read. Most likely they asked him, hey, what do you want to teach on? And Jesus said, you know what? Give me the scroll of Isaiah. And as he got the scroll of Isaiah, he opened it up. He scrolled to the specific place they would want to read. And it says there in the passage that he read, right, in verse 18 of chapter 4, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, to recover the sight of the blind, to set liberty to those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. The passage that Jesus read is a combination of Isaiah chapter 58, verse 6, and Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 and 2. Now, he didn't read the entirety of the verses. He kind of mashed them together. He left out the ending part of verse 2, which states, and the day of vengeance of our God. It's funny, he didn't go that far, but he said enough that already sparked a kind of intrigue into those that were in the synagogue that day. Omitting that last line, Jesus got the folks' attention with what he said. And then it says he closed the book, gave it back to the attendants, and sat down. By sitting down, know this, Jesus took the position of a teacher. Because again, as we talked, we kind of have it backwards here. I stand and teach, and you guys do what? Sit. In Jesus' day and time, the teacher got to do what? Sit. And everyone else kind of stood around. It hasn't worked out. We're not going to keep trying it. <laughs> but it says, he, as he took his seat, all eyes were on him that were in the synagogue. They, were, they weren't just like looking at him to see it. They were steadily glazing, staring, fixed on him to be like, now what's he going to say? How is he going to break this down? What truce does he have for them? And his opening line is, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So the message that Jesus taught that day, the words that he shared with the synagogue, his opening line is, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And we see in those verses there of Isaiah chapter 58, verse 6, and 61, verses 1 and 2, the message that Jesus had for the people. And what he showed them was truly the classes of people who would benefit from Jesus' ministry. The poor, the brokenhearted, the captives, the blind, and the oppressed. These categories portrayed the people who Christ came to save. And he had the power to do just that. As we read, what did the opening line say? He he has anointed me to do these things. In the prophecy, the Messiah announced that he would come to heal the damage that sin brought And sin's damage is so great and vast that it shows us there's a great work. (coughs) A great work of redemption to be done. So what did Jesus preach that day? Jesus' message first, to preach the gospel to the poor. The word poor often covers poverty of every kind, but the emphasis here is on not so much The poor is in wealth, but more the poor as far as morale and spiritual poverty, which is often and many times associated with the financially poor because they're downstrodden, they're beat, right? While the rich, on the other hand, are less likely to be aware of their spiritual poverty because why? They're caught up in their things. The Greek word for poor here is the same word that Jesus used in his first beatitude over in Mark, or Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, when he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Often it's the poor that are open to receiving Jesus' preaching and his teaching of the good news because they realize truly the desperate spiritual state that they find themselves in. And the Messiah came to bring good news to the poor. So first he shares about preaching the gospel to the poor. The second thing that he shares is to proclaim liberty to the captives. Now the word captives has a spiritual application here because often when you think of the word captives, 
Technically, it means a prisoner of war. Someone that's been captive, taken in, right? But looking at the word captives broadly, it includes many forms of spiritual bondage. Bondage to money, bondage to Satan, bondage to guilt, bondage to sensuality, bondage to hatred. Sin ties to us and holds us down. And sin will in turn make us captive and enslave us to many things making us truly prisoners of sin. But the Messiah came to bring the good news and set the captives free. The third thing that we see in his message was to recover sight to the blind. Recovering the sight of the blind is a mighty spiritual promise as many don't often see where they lack and what they lack. In fact, Jesus encouraged and even explained to Paul what his ministry would be over in Acts chapter 26 and verse 16 and verse 18. He says to um, to Paul, but rise and stand upon your feet. And jumping down to verse 18, he says, I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of their sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in God me. Through sin, we are blind, but the Messiah came to heal our spiritual and moral blindness and give us sight. And the fourth thing that the message that we see in Jesus' message there was first to preach the gospel to the poor, second to proclaim liberty to the captives, third to recover sight to the blind, and fourthly to set at liberty those who are oppressed. The root idea of the word oppressed is to be broken in pieces or shattered or crushed. The good news that Jesus came to those squashed by life's circumstances. Those that could not see a way out, those who found themselves oppressed, the Messiah came to give freedom through the good news. The message he taught to those in his hometown of Nazareth that day. These words. And as the congregation listened to Jesus, they took in the words that he had to say. They said, this is insightful. It's logical. He spoke with authority of the scripture. Luke said there, all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded from his mouth. They were captivized by the grace, by the charm of his words, but that's as far as it went that morning. As verse uh, 22 ends, they're all questioning who this is. As Luke records, they said, and they said, is this not Joseph's son? And this wasn't a question of like, hey, that's great, that's Joseph's son. They're thinking, that's Joseph's son. Who's this guy? Most everyone in attendance that day more than likely, had known Jesus since he was a little boy. When the family came back from Egypt, they set up shop. His father was the carpenter. They knew him to be a nice lad. They may have known him to be the kid down the street that never got into trouble. Some may have known him to be a great playmate. Later, they would have known him to be a carpenter. But their admiration apparently degenerated into cynicism when they said, is this not Joseph's son. Could the change be that Jesus' words were great, but they did not see themselves in the metaphors that were being shared. They did not see themselves wanting to be represented in what Christ was sharing to them. They wanted signs. They didn't want pretty words. They wanted to see something miraculous happen. But it would seem their minds were made up and they at that moment had chosen to reject Christ that was before them, that came to them. Which brings us to the last section that we will look at in the passage, a weighty rejection. Now before they can even say anything, Jesus speaks. And it's kind of cool when Jesus does that because Jesus responds to their rejection and says, you will surely say this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. 
Then he said to them, Surely I say to you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. At that very moment, Jesus could feel the tension in the room. He could feel the change. And instead of giving them opportunity to rise up and speak out, he speaks what's exactly on most of their minds at the time. And the fact of like, that's great. Your words are beautiful, but we want to see something. We came for the show, not the message. And in the 10 made it where they said, basically, they were not concerned about the poor, the captives, the blind, or the oppressed. Truly, they wanted to see some oohs and ahs. And honestly, they had enough evidence around them of the oohs and the ahs and the miracles surrounding them. The Galilee area wasn't that large. It was only like about 25 miles by 40 mile area. So they could have interacted and very well seen some different things that have already taken place. The problem was they wanted to see it firsthand. They had a front row opportunity and thought they deserved to see Jesus do something miraculous. And instead of debating this and bringing up evidence, Jesus jumps to the heart of the matter, their own self-centeredness and pride by giving them not one example of how they should act, but two examples from the Old Testament. And the two examples that we see, the first being that of Elijah and the widow. It says there in short in verse 25, but I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the day of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and there was a great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zephyr in the region of Sidron to the woman who was a widow. The account that Jesus calls here, recalls, goes back to 1 Kings chapter 17, where you can see it in its full play. But what happened was, is there was a famine in the land, and Elijah came across this woman who was gathering sticks to make a fire to prepare a meal for her and her son. Actually, in the passage, it says that her words were, I'm making a meal so that we can eat it and die. It was their last meal. They had no more food. They had no more to do. They were done. But Elijah responds to her. And to be honest, Elijah's response is really obscure. Elijah tells her this in 1 Kings chapter 17, in verse 13, he says to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. So she says she's going to go make a fire and prepare a meal, right? But he tells her here, But make a small cake from it first and bring it to me, and afterwards make some for yourself and your son. He goes on in verse 14 and he tells, says for us, For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day of the Lord sends rain on the earth. The woman, the widow, did as Elijah asked of her. And for as long as the phantom, phan, famine endured, guess what she had? Flour and oil. Unlike the people of Nazareth, she didn't demand a miracle first, and instead, Elijah insisted that it be the other way, that she would do, and then there would be the evidence of the deed. And that is exactly what happened. Very simply, she realized her absolute poverty in that moment, the fail of, failure of lack of resources for her life to live. Perhaps if she had had a barrel full of flour and oil when she met Eliza, she would have said, show me first, and then I'll believe. But she didn't have that barrel. So she trusted and stepped out in faith. Her blessing was that she was desperately poor, and she knew it. The application to the people in Nazareth was obvious. If they wanted evidence that Jesus claims to the poor and to the blind and the captives and the oppressed were true, they had that. They had to trust him. And there they would find plenty of evidence. Which in lies the problem before them. Because of their own eyes, they were not poor. They were good, respectable, synagogue attending, family oriented solid citizens of Nazareth. The comparison with the Gentile woman of Elijah's day was a massive insult to them. And just in case that wasn't enough of poking the bear, Jesus says, I got another one for you. 
How about Elisha and Naaman? As he goes on from there, he tells about that there were many leopards in the land of Israel that were not getting healed. Along comes Naam, Naam, the commander of a Syrian army that was sent there by the king of Syria to be cured of his leprosy. As he comes to Israel, Israel's king starts to freak out. He's like, why is there the Assyrians sending their commander over here? Maybe they want to go into battle. There's a pretext of that whole battle going on. And things are at them. So they come at him. They look at it. And Elisha comes to the king and says, you know what? When he arrives, send him to me. I will take care of this. There's no problem at hand. Now, when Nahum arrives, Elisha doesn't go to him. And Nahum doesn't go to him. Instead, Elisha sends a messenger down to Nahum. And he tells them, basically, go and wash yourself in the Jordan seven times, and you'll be cleansed. Nahum's response is found in 2 Kings chapter 5. The story is played out there for us to read. But in verse 11, this is what it says. But Nahum became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of his, the Lord his God and wave his hands over the place and heal the leprosy. He wanted to show, right? He continues in verse 12. It says, Are not the Abathan and the Fafar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Mind you, if you've seen the Jordan River, it is disgusting looking. It's like chocolate milk brown in color. I did see it. I looked at it. and I'm like, there's no way I'm going in that water. It's not the greatest looking water, right? There's better waters is what this guy's saying. And he says, could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. He was upset, right? Nahum wanted a show. He didn't get a show. And as he goes away, his servant decides to talk with him a bit and convinces him to do as Elisha said. He argues with him that if he had been told to do something great and something that he would have been proud of, he would have done it. So why not do the humiliating thing and get cleaned and be cured? That was the icing on the cake for the Nazarites that day. It was bad enough that they told, were told they were poor, they were blind, they were captive, they were oppressed, but now they, they were told that they were less spiritual and less wise than these Gentiles? That was just way too much. Before the service is even over, they're already in an uproar. They're pushing Jesus outside of the synagogue, down the street, out to the inner end of the land, to the edge of the hill on which the town was built, truly with the desire to throw him down over the cliff. Though they had never dreamed he was God, they certainly knew his character firsthand. Again, many grew up with him. They have never seen him do anything wrong. They have never seen him lie. Never seen him disobey his parents. Never had been unkind. In fact, he was probably the most loving, thoughtful, winsome person that they ever had known. He was undoubtedly locally famous for his acts of mercy. He was the most loving being they had ever encountered. But when Jesus cut their comfortable religious facade, they tried to lynch him. And it wasn't just a normal day they tried to lynch him on. It was the Sabbath. But Luke tells us as he concludes the passage for us, and he says there, they would have tossed him off the cliff and then stoned him had he not passed through their midst and gone away to do more ministry in other places. We end here. So like anything as we've been learning and doing, we come to a so what. And the so what that I have for us today is how do we view Jesus? Because I'll be honest with you. Sadly, how one views Jesus is a clear result of where they stand with Jesus and the relationship that they have with him. Some people in the church today are playing religion and have no real transformation experience of being born again. When you ask them that story, how'd you come to Christ? They don't have that watershed moment of, well, I was doing this and now I'm doing that. They have no answer for you. According to Christianity Today article done of a, 
um, poll, 15% of adults in evangelical churches don't even identify themselves as born-again believers. 15% in the church don't do that. Why is that? It's their view of Jesus. Much like the people of Nazareth. People have a problem imagining Jesus in a way where he's coming at them. Because often they want to imagine Jesus as the sweet, small baby Jesus that came in that manger. The one that they can sit and look at for a month. That's the Jesus they want to see. That's the Jesus that they admire. The problem is, there's the grown-up Jesus. The Jesus that flipped tables. The Jesus that was a little harsh with people. Because why? He loved them and wanted to see them saved. The same Jesus that laid down his life for his followers. That's the Jesus that people have a hard time accepting. They cannot view their Savior in that way. Our view of Jesus truly shapes how we have our relationship with Christ. How we stand as a follower of Christ and how we walk with God. You see, when we view Jesus as one who came to preach the gospel to the poor, to proclaim liberties, to set the captives free, to recover the sight of the blind, and to set the liberties of those who were oppressed free, that's the Jesus we can find and see, and we know we are at the right place. Again, it takes that moment and understanding and having the right view of Jesus to be able to follow him each and every day. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. I thank you for our time together. As we just, we grow, we learn, but we can see truly the plan that you had for us in that moment that marked that change with the birth of the Son, Lord, from B.C. to A.D., and how in our lives we should also reflect the same, that life before Christ and the life after Christ. So, Lord, I pray for us each as we go about our day and our weeks, and this prayer that you continue to guide us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.